So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Heather Penny, Senior Fellow with the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, and welcome to Aerospace Nation. We're pleased that General Adrian Spain could join us today. He's currently serving as Director of Plans, Programs, and Analyses at the United States Air Forces in Europe and Air Forces Africa. He leads theater engagement throughout Europe and Africa by managing unit basing, organization, and force structure. The job also includes developing and directing the command's resource capability processes, doctrine review, strategy initiatives, and political military affairs programs, as well as overseeing command analyses and lessons learned. So pretty, pretty busy there. Uh, he's also a career fighter pilot with time in the F-15C and the F-22. So again, uh, thank you, General, and for taking the time with us today. I'd like to kick things off by giving you the opportunity to make a few opening remarks. And with that, thank you again, and over to you. Okay, well, thanks again, Heather. It's really an honor to be here with you. I'm a big fan of the broadcast uh, and appreciate the work that you all do at the Mitchell Institute. Uh, and on behalf of General Horigian, I'd just like to say thanks uh, for letting me be a part of the discussion with you. And speaking of General Horigian, uh, as my boss here and, and the, uh, the MATCHCOM commander, um, I, I'll start with uh, some things that are near and dear to his heart. Um, number one, how he describes our AORs. Uh, as you know, it's uh, USAFE and AF Africa. Uh, and so I'll talk a little bit about how he describes that theater of operation and those theaters of operations, I guess you, I guess you could say, uh, as well as his priorities. And then we can get into, I think that'll dovetail nicely into the discussions that we have teed up for today. Um, so from a AOR's perspective, he kind of starts up north and, and looks at the, the Barents Sea uh, and the Arctic. Uh, he starts working his way to the southwest in the GI-UK gap. Uh, moves back over to the Baltics uh, and looks at that area of operation and the things that are going on there and the concerns that uh, and the conditions that are in that uh, that part of the world moving further south uh, into the Mediterranean and then um, certainly central and eastern are, are, uh, are generally at the top of his mind <clears throat> but throughout the Mediterranean and then then moving down into Africa into North Africa eastern and western Africa as well. Uh, all of which are slightly different in terms of the environment, in terms of capabilities there, certainly from an air component perspective, uh, and draw different, um, I guess, conclusions when it comes to, hey, what would be most effective within this area and how do we um, uh, sh uh, show our resolve with our partners in those, in those areas of the theaters uh, to, uh, to be a determined, uh, resilient, ready force uh, that has options from an air component perspective for the combatant commanders uh, to um, negate or, and deter an aggressive adversary or an adversary uh, who's competing with us on a daily basis. And so uh, that's the, the view of the AORs from his perspective, which is pretty broad and, uh, and, uh, and, and certainly wide and takes up a lot of our time. Uh, from a priority standpoint, <clears throat> uh, we look at four things. So people, posture, partnerships, and readiness. Uh, people, obviously, as you, you have seen the Accelerate Change or Lose uh, paper that General Brown uh, recently put out. Obviously, we, we want ready, resilient, empowered airmen uh, who, are, who have the ability and our resource to compete, deter, and win uh, every day, um, and certainly in crisis or conflict. Um, the ability for us to be able to resource our airmen here in this theater is critical and, and, and with our partners, frankly, uh, is critical to our ability to deter. It's critical to our ability to compete, whether you're talking about in the high north, uh, in the middle part of the European continent, in, in the Mediterranean, or in the African continent. Um, from a, a readiness standpoint, uh, you go from the, the people uh, option or people priority to the readiness priority. Uh, obviously, we need to be ready to compete every day. Our, uh, I'll talk about partnerships here in a minute, but uh, our ability to leverage our partners here and ensure that not only are US forces uh, in these AORs ready to, to compete and fight, uh, but our partners are ready to compete and fight with us and uh, in an integrated and interoperable fashion uh, to be able to deter, compete, and win uh, really on any given day in any mission area. And obviously as an air component and certainly in, in for the crowd that's listening today, <clears throat> you know, our, our focus is on domain superiority, right? And so our ability to deliver air superiority at the time and place of our choosing uh, in, this, in these theaters is critical and it is the critical 
uh, component of our, uh, of our role in the joint force and in the joint fight uh, for uh, any combat operation going forward. We know that without it, we lose. We know that without it and uh, without our partners um, helping to establish uh, air superiority and we're able, um, and if able, air dominance, uh, we, we want to continue to strive toward that with them arm in arm and, and ready to lock, uh, um, uh, aligned with them as we go forward and building out that battle space. Uh, partnership. So I've talked a little bit about that. Obviously, in, the, in these theaters, everything that we do here revolves around our ability to work by, with, and through our partners, both in the European continent and in the African continent. Um, our ability to strengthen um, their uh, capabilities and capacity to integrate and inter interoperate with them in every corner of the theater is vitally important to our ability to deter. And frankly, it's the one thing that keeps our adversaries at bay is the knowledge that when, our, when the alliance is called or when the coalition is called, uh, there are, it's not just the US that's coming, it's us with our friends and with our partners and with our allies. Uh, and showing no daylight between us and them at any point is really key to deterrence and key to reestablishing deterrence when it fails prior to a conflict arising and pr prior to a crisis arising. Um, Let's see. I think I think we talked through all four of them. I, I think I'll pause there, and uh, and we'll uh, we'll let you get back to your questions. <laughs> Thank you for that overview. Um, so I, I do want to dig deeper into some of the points that you mentioned. So uh, as the headlines regularly highlight, America is currently facing the resurgence of the pure state competition, which you mentioned. How does this impact the way in which you and your team are looking to manage force structure in Europe? A great question, and it reminded me that I, I didn't talk about posture. So this is this is a good lead-in. Uh, so posture is the fourth priority uh, for General Reagan here in these theaters. Uh, I, I, I think that the uh, the key part for us to recognize is that um, you know number one, it is no secret that we're a fraction of the force that we used to have here in this in this European theater for sure, and in the African continent, there has never been a, a, a compared to other uh, AORs, a significant force posture on the ground in that continent. Um, I think we need to acknowledge that, that that is, that is the state that we're in today. And we also need to acknowledge that we're not gonna go back to 30 years ago where we had seven times the number of troops and bases and, and capacity here in theater. Um, and so our posture is, is driven by what we have now um, and, and what our partners have and what we're able to bring to the fight together. Uh, and so from, a, from a, a viewpoint of the theaters, from going from the Arctic down to, the, down to South Africa, uh, our posture is viewed through the lens of, can we, do we have the capability and capacity to quickly um, survive and fight in the face of an, uh, a surprise attack on our forces um, and or to anticipate that attack uh, and, and then respond in kind uh, masked either with U.S. forces or with a coalition that can quickly reestablish deterrence in any corner of either of these AORs. Uh, and and that, you know, if you read into that, that all that say, all that is to say, are we providing air superiority, air domain options for the combatant commanders in these theaters, and are we able to do that quickly in the face of a uh, um, an unanticipated attack and in the face of an anticipated attack where we have strategic warning. So we, we want to continue to build INW, we want to continue to have uh, force posture from a US perspective that allows us to quickly act and react if required. Uh, but also we need to be informed by the partner presence that we have in this theater as well and not forget that there is significant capability uh, in the forces that exist in the air domain that's here on the continent. Um, certainly with our NATO partners, but also with the coalition partners that happen to be in this theater, there is there is significant knowledge of the threat and knowledge of the domain, knowledge of the AOR uh, that we can learn from and we need to continue to, to operate with and leverage uh, so that we can get better and they can get better and we can, we can all get better and more ready to get. Uh, that's really... Um... That's really uh, wonderful to know that you're working this um, so aggressively. Uh, I'm, I'd like to dig a little bit deeper into some of what you mentioned regarding capacity, um, right? Uh, you mentioned that there's no, it's no secret that the Air Force is a fraction of size 
that it was at the end of the Cold War. But with multiple threats on the ascent, uh, aircraft and airmen are stretched thin. And you mentioned this a little bit previously. Could you talk a little bit more about some of those difficult realities? Yeah, uh, that, thanks for that question, Heather. You know, there, there, there's no doubt that there's a draw to uh, the wars that we've been fighting for the last, also the last 30 years. So, um, you know, we, we've, as an air component, spent uh, since 91 all of our time in the Middle East. Uh, now, I, I will say that some of that, and we'll talk more base defense and agile combat employment here in a little bit, uh, some of that has given us the ability to train at a lower scale um, and at a, a, a non-highly contested environment to skill sets that we will need in a highly contested environment in this theater, for sure. Uh, forces that are under threat and learning how to protect our power projection platforms and our bases uh, with, you know, shorter range, uh, you know, over the fence line, over the wire kind of threats, uh, but still threatened nonetheless, while also building out a layered defense for one-way attack UASs and potential cruise missile attacks to a certain degree in the Middle East. That thankfully hasn't borne out all that often, uh, but still gives us a, a glance and a glimpse into the kinds of capabilities that would be required in a higher, uh, a more highly contested environment. And so, so, so while there is a, a competing uh, demand on those forces, you know, we don't run from that. That's, that's something that also allows us to train in the fight, but we do need to um, continually assess the risk that we're taking against the high end fight uh, by going into environments that decrease readiness for that, uh, for that eventuality and understanding that we need to be prepared to do both. We're not, uh, you know, we're still not getting completely out of the counter VEO fight in any theater. We'll certainly talk about that in Africa. Uh, but so we still need to be prepared to support that globally as the, as the uh, 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 Secretary of Defense and the President demand. Uh, but we also know that the National Defense Strategy and all of our strategic documents direct us to be prepared for the high end fight. Uh, and we're absolutely lockstep with General Brown and his challenge really to uh, accelerate the need to change in order to win and in order to compete and in order to deter as we go forward. Um, and being ready for both to a degree is, is a part of that mindset that we're gonna have to ride for a while um, and, and understand that uh, it's not only the, the freedom to know that the forces that you have assigned to your theater are always available, it may be that you fight with what you have, as we always do, and then you quickly know how to get forces uh, to reinforce your either hardened positions or your attack posture and stance uh, from back from CENTCOM or forward from CONUS uh, to be able to augment the forces that you need to, to either deter, blunt, uh, or counterattack as required, depending on the situation. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll delve a little bit further into um, that a little bit later in our conversation, but I'd like to dig into what you had mentioned previously about um, agile combat employment. Uh, could you describe how that fits into this, this, this broad new reality for USAFE? You bet. Um, so the, uh, you know, there's, I think, very clearly a realization and a recognition that uh, air for the air component in particular, but certainly for our forces that uh, the lead that we had against uh, potential adversaries has shrunk, if not gone away in some areas uh, altogether, right? So um, I think agile combat employment is a natural evolution of that recognition that, hey, the way that we, we have been uh, employing and uh, consolidating for the past 25 to 30 years is not going to be the way that wins in the future. And so uh, the concepts of maneuver, agility, and resilience uh, are things that have to and, and naturally have come back into the forefront because of the circumstance that, hey, this is all contested. We're gonna fight from our home bases. That, you know, In Garrison is no longer a sanctuary or a concept that, uh, that really even makes sense anymore, right? They're all fighting postures, particularly in the forward theaters. Uh, for us in an Indo, PACOM, we feel that uh, a little more acutely, but even the homeland is no longer a sanctuary. And so, so once you start thinking about it that way and you, you, know, you, you remove the eye shades and you, you come out from, uh, you know, your, your uh, um, you know, you remove your, I guess, ro rose colored glass, glasses, I guess if that's still a phrase, um, you, you, you really look clear eyed at the situation, 
you start to realize, hey, I, I need to be able to maneuver to survive. I need to be able to communicate from a distributed position in order to complicate the adversary's pro targeting problem. Uh, I need to increase the cost calculus for them uh, in order to preserve the capacity that I have in theater and bring in more uh, forces as required uh, in order to win the fight, right? But until then, until the forces show up uh, or until we build the coalition, I'm going to have to to uh, uh, to to do our best with what we have, uh, either from a um, uh, from a hunker down position and ju and just ride it out and survive, or from a a, a, a fighting posture where we have to counterattack uh, and throw a punch in order to to blunt a, a force movement. And, and halt something to get us back to a political dialogue. And so agile combat employment is really that idea that, hey, we need to have enough ability to disperse either preemptively or reactively to preserve the force in order to allow for the time to be built and to bring in either a full coalition that is able to completely blunt an attack or to bring in reinforcements from a nearby theater or from CONUS uh, to be able to counterattack effectively uh, to halt an aggressor and get back to a political dialogue. And if that fails, then we go fight and we win. Uh, and, and that agile employment concept uh, allows us to do that for longer. Um, it isn't a panacea. It will never solve all of our problems. It certainly doesn't replace capacity at the end of the day. But in the absence of capacity, we have to be able to move around and we have to be able to communicate and still command and control forces with hopefully mission type orders uh, that give commanders intent that's clear eyed uh, and, and with trained forces that know how to move around a theater, maybe on their own for a period of days until they can get themselves back into the fight. So clearly a major difference between uh, the challenges that we saw within the Cold War uh, is this issue of capacity, right? But it was also that it was really a unipolar threat. I mean, it was a Soviet Union versus, versus the United States. Uh, but now our competition is is more than that. It's it's multipolar. So beyond capacity, how do you see this this these multipolar challenges changing the way that we need to to counter these threats? Yeah, that um, th that's a, a great way to to characterize that, and that's the major difference, right, between the Cold War and now is that we have an additional peer slash near peer adversary that uh, has uh, shown and uh, a willingness to be more aggressive and to, um, uh, and to attempt to dominate regions in, a, in an unfair way, really, for the sovereignty of the nations that are involved. Uh, and that is happening on multiple fronts now, as opposed to a bipolar uh, type of a world order. Uh, and so uh, I think our key characteristic is understanding that um, we, we will need to uh, be prepared to be flexible in our theater and in other theaters to compete on a daily basis, both with Russia and with China. And, and we don't get to choose the, the places in which we compete often. You know, we can choose some of them, uh, but we're going to have to respond in areas that we might not want to be in with them in order to compete there and in order to not cede territory and in order to keep pressure on and in order to uh, really shine a light on the, um, uh, a, a aggressive and adversarial behavior that some of our uh, our potential adversaries are showing on a daily basis with respect to the nations that we view as friends and, and that we want to grow uh, capacity in a way that helps build them uh, along with us as opposed to take advantage of them or, or use them in a predatory manner just to get uh, their own needs met. So I think our, you know, as freedom loving countries, you know, you could, you could uh, you know, as we look at the, the, the multipolar world, um, and some of the, the rhetoric you may hear from some of those nations about being uh, encircled. I think it's not the U.S. that's encircling them. It's freedom that's encircling them. Uh, and there's an, a discomfort with that because it's closer to their borders than they uh, are, um, have traditionally uh, appreciated, I guess. Uh, but we want to continue to grow that. You know, we want to continue to grow uh, those freedoms and those kinds of democratic institutions um, that they're uncomfortable with. And it allows us to deter and it allows us to build partnerships and it allows us to ensure um, that we get one more day of deterrence. And, and that's the goal. And I know both General Harrigan and General Walters would, would say that, you know, a win is another day of deterrence, certainly in this theater. Uh, and by doing that and by ensuring that we get closer and closer with our partners, uh, we buy one more day of deterrence every day, but one day at a time, uh, 
but we're ready. If there's a fight that breaks out, we're ready. And we're, we're continually refining our concepts uh, to be able to, to match the need for today's environment. And if called upon, we'll, we'll respond appropriately. So you already mentioned um, really surrounding the, these, surrounding our competitors with, with freedom loving countries, you know, similar partners and allies that share the same value sets and uh, objectives that we do. So uh, allies are clearly a crucial component of meeting the mission demand specifically within the European theater, although that's true across the globe. Would you mind walking us around the map and explaining to us the status of our respective relationships? So for example, with nations like the United Kingdom and Italy, now members of the fifth generation club, this is really a certain, certainly an interesting time. Um, so how does this impact our ability to make that, you know, one more day of deterrence? Uh, so, so I think what, where I'll go with this is, um, is really just broadly describing the nature of the relationships as opposed to calling out the, the you know, 104 nations that we could talk about in our specific <laughs> relationship with them. Um, but, you know, we'll use the, you know, the F-35 nations as an example. Uh, and when we talk about partnerships, it's sometimes, and I've never been stationed in this theater until I got here a year ago. And so uh, I grew up here, but I hadn't been here as an officer until last fall. Uh, and so a lot of the nuances of the theater work, you know, I'd read about just like everybody else had read about, but I hadn't really experienced uh, as an adult or as an airman. Uh, and what you realize when you come here is, you know, I mentioned the capacity that our partners have uh, and, and the ability for, for them to, uh, to really join with us and, and help us along with, and, and, and partner with us in, in, in this deterrence mission that we've got. And, once to, and if deterrence fails and in a, in a crisis or conflict mission. Uh, but from an F-35 perspective, this, this really comes into clear view. Um, you know, right now there are roughly 40-ish, 50-ish uh, F-35s in the theater. Um, zero are US F-35s. In 2030, oh, 2023, there'll be over 200. Um, we'll start getting US F-35s in 2021. So of those uh, 240-ish F-35s in 2023, 54 of them will be US F-35s. In 2030, there'll be over 500 F-35s in theater. And these are partners that are, have already committed to purchasing airplanes. These are not you know, folks who are under deliberation. Um, and the F-35 is competing as a potential replacement for uh, current generation aircraft. Uh, of those over 500 airplanes, uh, uh, F-35 aircraft, only 54 will be U.S. aircraft, right? And so the game here almost flips on its head when you look at it from that perspective and you have 500 plus fifth gen airplanes in 2030 that are, you know, and it's our job now to, to see that future and build towards an interoperable, interdependent, integrated capacity in this theater so that if the balloon goes up, it's not just us and a special partner that know how to go fight together. It's us and our, not only our F-35 partners, but also anybody with advanced fighter capabilities and with C2 capabilities and with refueling capabilities and with ISR capability and with space capability. Uh, we all know how to come together in a multi-domain fight to very quickly halt an aggressive adversary um, on our terms and bring back a deterrent posture that allows us to, to again, reestablish a political dialogue uh, and, and get, uh, get out of the kinetic arena as quickly as we can on our terms or on terms favorable to us. Uh, and so what we see from our partners now, I, I think generally <clears throat> is a willingness and, a, uh, and acceptance of uh, this idea that is spelled out in the national defense strategy as, 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 that includes Russia as an, an aggressive adversary, most dangerous type adversary uh, going forward, even if the pacing threat is China, uh, and realizing that, hey, we have a role to play in this theater, and not realizing, they of course know that, um, but understanding that we all share a role in making this happen. Uh, and they are, they are you know, I, I'm here to tell you the partners that, that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis are all very interested in, in helping to present a harder target across the board uh, so that there isn't any mischief that's played out and, and no fait accompli kind of assumptions that uh, have been utilized in the past. We know as much as people watch our playbook, we know their playbook as well. We've seen a couple of examples of it uh, around this part of the world and in the Middle East for sure. Uh, 
uh, Northern Africa as well. Uh, so we kind of know what, you know, what game they're playing uh, and we want to be postured and ready to ensure that, that, that they aren't able to play under their terms. Uh, and, and our partners here get that and they understand it and they, and they are, they are aggressively modernizing to be able to present a united front against a, uh, an, an, an opportunity like that for them. It's interesting you mentioned, um, you know, the, the, the unusual ratio of F-35 uh, for the Air Force versus U.S. Air F-35s versus partner F-35s, right, of the 5,000 or 500 aircraft, only 54 of that I'll would be uh, U.S. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll take 5,000. <laughs> we need that capacity for sure. Um, but sticking with the theme of allies and Vigen, uh, clearly the partner training is going to be a really important piece of this. So could you please speak to a us a little bit about the partner training and how that's evolving now that the capabilities uh, that are, they can bring to the fold with F-35, it's so different, it's vastly different. So it's important to ensure the seamless operations across all spectrums as this new technology really matures and we become much more adept at the TTP. So could you talk a little bit about the partner training and, and how that's folding into your considerations? You bet. Um, so we're, we're uh, um, I think the other recognition that we've had over the last several years is uh, certainly we've learned this lesson in the F-22 community. You know, we have a couple hundred F-35s on the U.S. side, just not in this theater yet, but uh, we're, uh, we are learning that in the fifth gen training model, that the way that we used to train uh, is not going to be sufficient going forward. Our um, you know, our airspaces are not uh, large enough. The, uh, you know, you can't have enough uh, adversary air to really stress more than a four ship of F-35s or F-22s at, at a reasonable cost uh, in the airspaces that we have available. There's, you know, the emitters, while they are getting better, and all of this is getting better, not to say that we're, we're stagnant in these capabilities, uh, but we're, you know, we're quickly running out of the real estate required to fully stress out fifth gen airplanes, especially if you talk, if you were to talk, you know, the unthinkable, you know, an eight ship of F-35s plus a four ship of F-22s, you know, in an airspace, what, what is the, what is the threat lay down that would, you know, that would aggressively and optimally challenge that force posture, right? We just don't get to see that very often in the real world. And so we've all come to this recognition that, they are, our most high-end and aggressive training is going to take place virtually, synthetically. Uh, and so how do we build out that infrastructure that uh, not only allows us to stress the, uh, the capabilities of the pilot and the, uh, and the aircraft and the partnership, uh, but also um, you know, doesn't uh, forget that you're still flying high-performance airplanes and there's a level of airmanship that's required to get out and get uh, you know, seat in the air kind of training and, and get proficiency in that regard as well. You know, getting out to the airspace, getting back, learning how to deal with air traffic control, learning, you know, when your systems aren't working perfectly, when the weather's not perfect, when people aren't where they're supposed to be, when the comm's not good, um, you have to be able to, to simplify what you're doing and the tasks that you're executing and fly the airplane. Uh, if it's too much in the sim, uh, then you lose some of that capability and proficiency from an airmanship standpoint. So finding the right balance of high-end training in the simulator with the blocking and tackling of airmanship in, from an air domain perspective um, is really critical. Uh, what we call that is OTI, Operational Training Infrastructure, uh, is where we're, as an Air Force, trying to improve our capability and capacity. Nellis Air Force Base is doing some really interesting things. Uh, with their uh, with their simulator capacity that they're building and capability that they're building out there, uh, that's pretty exciting. Uh, and our partners, as they gain fifth gen capability, are learning this as well. And so, while we don't have the assets here in theater um, yet, uh, we do have a lot of experience that we port over and that we're able to access uh, from a reach back perspective. That if we don't have it here um, in the headquarters, to be able to help guide and shape uh, what we're doing here and how our ranges need to grow and what kind of infrastructure we need to be able to train effectively and what balance of synthetic and live training we need to forge to be able to work optimally together to train efficiently together with our partners but you know not just I mentioned earlier not just on the fifth gen side uh, but those who have uh, advanced fighter capabilities or advanced C2 capabilities that are able to to contribute to the fight uh, we have to be able to plug them in so that when the flag goes up, we're all ready to go and it's not a pickup game 
because we've done it before and we've done it multiple times and we know who the players are uh, and we're ready to meet at the cap limit line and push when it's time to go. That's that's excellent. It sounds like you've really brought a lot of your own experience, uh, you know, flying the Raptor, flying uh, the uh, Eagle uh, to your considerations of the needs for airmanship and actual live training, um, combining that with OTI and the simulator training in order to really achieve that that stressed environment. But integrating that's more than just having the simulators and and the OTI. Uh, really a lot of integration is going to come down to uh, what the Air Force is now pursuing um, in ABMS and JATC2. These are clearly significant priorities for the Air Force. Can you uh, explain how you see them changing the operational realities for you safety and what challenges and opportunities do you see? Absolutely. So uh, we're, we're really thankful for the opportunity to partner with the HAF and with uh, our joint partners, frankly, with the uh, as JATC2 is the number one joint priority as well. It's not just an Air Force priority, uh, but it was great to work uh, under Chief Goldfein along uh, the lines of the JADC2 and ABMS efforts. I know it's always JADC2 slash ABMS. They're really two different things, right? So the command and control architecture uh, that allows us to connect the sensors and the shooters and be able to pass the data is the JADC2 portion. ABMS uh, from a, is evolving as we speak and is kind of almost uh, as much a mindset as it is a capability and is in the evolution of the, the way that we do battle management and the way that we uh, command and control tactically across a theater. Uh, and, and so we're still learning how that's going to uh, play out completely, but we uh, almost immediately set up a team here in the headquarters to plug into uh, the half with uh, AFWIC and their team that's working JADC2 and to work with Dr. Roper and their team on the experiments and the on-ramps that they're doing, trying to learn from them uh, because we know that ACE really only works under a JADC2-like construct. Now, we're kind of, you know, trying to do JADC2 before it's JADC2, you know, before it becomes a, you know, a fully fledged thing uh, and we all know what it is. We're all, you know, what, what we feel like we can do uh, today and, and where our strength is, is in figuring out what is available now to connect, uh, to be able to, to, um, to look at sensor laydowns and build domain awareness first uh, is probably the quickest thing that we can offer to the JADC2 effort. And while they're working top down uh, on the architectures and on, the, uh, uh, on the, the languages and the open systems and the, uh, um, and the, the digital interfaces that allow us to talk uh, between systems and, and building that connectivity from the ground up so it's open, so the, so the, uh, the, the, uh, the programming is open system from the beginning uh, so that we know it can connect. Uh, we also, same reality, know that everything that exists right now was not built that way. And so we have to figure out ways to connect them uh, through gateways or other you know, authorities that uh, require national and bilateral agreements. Uh, and so we're focusing um, very diligently on trying to build out these sensor connect connections and networks through our exercise program. Uh, Astral Night is an exercise we're about ready to execute where that is a significant focus, not only partnering with our Army brothers and sisters over at USER year, um, uh, and the 10th AAMDC, who's doing a fantastic job of, of building out a, an architecture and, and working with us to connect the sensors that they are bringing to play in this exercise, uh, but also with our partners across the board. And so we want to uh, be able to build a, um, a, a network, a grid, you know, to, to, to use those terms, a sensing grid that allows us to share the data uh, even before we have the effectors, right? So you know, in, in a you know, non-perfect world, but in an evolution of where we are today, you know, we have the connections that allow us to know when a threat is inbound, hopefully hours away, right? And, and along the way to U.S. and U.S. forces, it's going through partner nations, and maybe there's somebody else that can take that thing out, whatever that threat is, on the way before it ever gets close to us. But even if not, with enough advanced warning, we can disperse, and then the ACE concepts come into play where, hey, we're just more survivable. And so what that means is, you know, the enemy has to, you know, isn't going to be able to take this low risk, unattributable uh, pot shot at us and, and knowing that they have a high degree of success uh, opportunity by doing so. Um, and certainly it could take out a pretty significant portion of, of forces if they get it, if they get it right. 
uh, if we're able to disperse effectively, if we're able to warn effectively, and then if we're able to defend effectively later, uh, all of those things cut down the percentages of success rate uh, for an adversary and in increase the cost for them, uh, not just from a resource perspective, but from an attributability standpoint uh, and a, you know, a, a, a uh, call it a, you know, a black eye on the global stage, right? So they aren't going to be able to just hide in the shadows and say they didn't do it. We're going to know they did it. We're going to shine the spotlight on them. And it's not going to be very effective, all of which in our mind means they'll pick a different avenue. They'll pick another way to, to, uh, to try to achieve their objectives. It won't be kinetic. It won't be something that puts our power projection platforms at risk uh, because we can do just enough ACE and just enough base defense uh, and we have just enough connectivity as we build our way out to the vision of JADC2, which is interconnected grids that get any sensor to any shooter or any sensor to the right shooter with the right weapon uh, and achieve the effect that we want instantaneously as machines talk to machines instead of, uh, instead of humans uh, tracking all of that information and putting a human on the loop to allow that kill chain to be completed as opposed to having to have humans in the loop throughout the entire process uh, in a lot of ways, slowing things down because we, for every place we have a human, we have a rule uh, and our security uh, apparatus and our architectures are, are still uh, often working in a Cold War paradigm where we, you know, where no is the first answer as opposed to, hey, what's the, what's the tactical risk? What's the operational and strategic risk? Uh, and is it, is that risk higher than uh, the risk of sharing data or connecting with partners and friends uh, in a theater that's under, uh, you know, that we'll call it within the first island chain, the chain in a European sense, um, and, and a forward inside kind of a force, um, which risk is is worse? And uh, and I think we would we would argue it's 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 worth it to share with our friends to uh, elite, you know, to dissuade uh, the uh, the propensity to 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 go after a kinetic type of an attack. Um, and show a different path or force uh, and funnel a, an adversary toward a different path uh, than one that looks pretty tempting, um, you know, certainly, or has looked pretty tempting in the past. You bring up some really interesting points regarding um, sort of the, the doctrine, the policy, the security policies, the TTPs, and all of these pieces uh, really are things that I'm glad that you're thinking about because so much focus has been on the technology piece but we need to make sure that that is tightly integrated and in many ways driven by the, the doctor and the TTPs. And we have to have the policies to support that in place, like you mentioned about the security policies. You know, unfortunately, I've, I haven't even gotten through half of my questions. First of all, your portfolio is so broad and interesting. Um, we have so much more to talk about. So I, I hope that we're able to bring you back again uh, for a second uh, for another aerospace nation. I would like to ask one parting question before we get into the questions from the audience. So uh, this is the resource question, right? Um, as we wrap up this portion of the session, it's clear that the scale and the scope of your challenges uh, that you have to address on a daily basis uh, is enormous. So if you were given an extra dollar to help provide more capabilities, capacity, um, where would you direct that? So one more dollar, what would you buy? Where would you spend it? All right, I'm, I'm going to take some liberties with your question, and I'm going to, I'm going to take two dollars, and I'm going to give you two answers. Um, but uh, I think part of this is is in understanding the domain and understanding the threat uh, and the threat um, the threat vectors. You know, it, it, with domain awareness, we can do a lot of things. We may not have the effectors, uh, but understanding the domain and building in the sensor coverage and networks and connectivity uh, from a, a domain awareness perspective. I think is critical to be able to survive and operate in this theater, and it certainly is uh, critical to to operationalizing JADC2 uh, and the concepts that come along with that. Uh, the 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 as a part of the um, General Hurricane's priorities, you know, force protection is job one for us as a MATCHCOM, and so on, making sure that our forces have adequate protect, protection at their bases um, and and that uh, they are they are operating and have the resources to protect themselves and to punch back if required at a local level. Uh, but if you brought, if you expand that out, the second dollar goes to hey, protecting our power projection platforms here in theater, uh, ensuring that um, there isn't a vulnerable opening uh, 
uh, for an adversary to take an easy shot at, at us with our forces here and that we have the uh, legitimate capability to bring forces forward and operate here from our bases, uh, not with impunity. We know we're going to be stressed. It's a highly contested environment culturally and cognitively. We as a nation haven't really had to think about uh, fighting with 15% losses a day or 30% losses in a mission. Um, that's the kind of fight we're talking about, though. And so we're not talking about 100% secure, safe, uh, protected environment, but we are talking about uh, defense for our forces and the ability to continue to mass firepower uh, on a scale required to win a fight, either in, in a short fight or in a long fight, uh, while, while continually bringing forces forward um, as required, either from a you know, bomber task force kind of perspective where they come in, they don't land, they go back home uh, and they launch from, uh, from a sanctuary where they can still have an effect uh, or we're able to, to build sanctuary here where we can bring them uh, in a little bit closer. We, are, we have the fortitude and the resiliency to operate from this forward location because we have the right amount of base defense in place uh, and in play to protect our platforms that project power here in this theater, both from a U.S. perspective and a partner perspective. And so we're beginning to have those, those two conversations. So I, I know you said $1. Uh, I'll take two sensors to, to characterize the domain and then an ability to protect the forces and the platforms uh, slash runways that we've got here um, to be able to, to execute with, the, with that capacity and capability. Thank you. If you'll now forgive we'll me. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I'd like to move into uh, our, our audience questions. We do have uh, an attendee with a question, Michael Gordon. Yeah, thank you. It's uh, Michael Gordon from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, sir, I have uh, two um, questions and um, after your interesting address. Um, first question is, um, what are the Russians doing in Libya these days? General Harigian addressed that in recent months, but uh, it's been a little while since um, I've heard what their air presence is in Libya and what they're doing with that base there. And second, um, there was a B-52 exercise in the Southern Med recently, a maritime intercept operation. And I've n noticed that uh, bomber task force missions have been pretty um, carried out pretty energetically in recent weeks and leading to the Russian intercept in the Black Sea and following a B-52 into Danish airspace. Um, What's going on with those exercises? Are, are you being more energetic or are the Russians being more aggressive? Why, why do we have more of these sort of episodes or is it both really? Mike, thanks for, uh, thanks for those questions. And uh, I'll start with, I, I think I'll, I'll start with the second one because uh, I probably don't have too much more to add to General Horigian's comments uh, about the Russians in Libya at, at this point or on this forum. Um, but I will, uh, okay, I'll start with the first one, sorry. I'll go back to that. Uh, we're, we're continuing to monitor uh, what, uh, what, what activities are taking place in Libya. Uh, we certainly want to ensure that there is visibility where we're able to provide it, uh, both with, uh, um, you know, in our AF Africa hat and in our uh, use safety hat uh, from an ISR perspective um, and from a, a domain awareness perspective, which we kind of just talked about. But we're continuing to keep tabs on on what is happening down there to understand the environment and understand uh, uh, what um, on a daily basis is, is going on in case conditions change or escalate quickly. Uh, what I understand uh, lately is that the, uh, the, the sides have, um, you know, have largely held to the ceasefire that is, was established and, but we're gonna continue to monitor that going forward. We haven't taken our eye off of that in any way, shape or form. And we wanna continue to call out Russian bad behavior uh, through the uh, Wagner Group um, down in uh, down in Libya, where it's where it's warranted and where it's appropriate, uh, through our combatant command in uh, in Africa. Uh, moving on to the bomber task force, I, I'll, I'll tell you, um, the bomber task force has been uh, a real um, uh, opportunity for us, and it really gets to uh, General Horigian's, General Walters' uh, guidance to us, and 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 and. Uh, an emphasis on competing every day and competing in order to deter. And so I think what you're seeing in the bomber task force and in operations in the Black Sea and in the, uh, and, uh, and up north and in the Baltics is, um, you know, is, is essentially uh, ensuring that um, U.S. aircraft fly in international airspace um, where, uh, where we are allowed to fly um, 
and, and exercising our ability and right to do so with our partners and ensuring that Russia sees that you know, there, is no, uh, there is nothing that they are doing that is breaking up the alliance and the partnerships that we have in this theater. Uh, and you know, the bomber task force missions that flew over 30 NATO uh, nations is an example of that. And uh, you know, of the things that we do, uh, I think that the, this is a prime example of, of the thing that, um, you know, that has some of the biggest effect, uh, frankly, in, in proving that, that you know, there is no daylight between us and the Alliance. And, and while always imperfect, uh, it is also still strong and, and, and our partnerships are still strong and, um, and any attempt to, to, to kind of come between us in that way isn't going, to, isn't going to work. So I appreciate that question. I think what you'll see is that the Bomber Task Force missions are going to continue to emphasize uh, the partnerships and interoperability and integration with partner uh, air forces uh, and where possible ground forces through our exercise program. Uh, and joint forces writ large. So we, we've done some work with the Navy and the Black Sea as well. That was, uh, that was highly effective uh, and certainly an opportunity for growth uh, there. And I, I think you're going to see us take advantage of that, uh, you know, uh, at the, at, at, as often as we can and as often as uh, seems, uh, or I guess as is, is reasonable in the minds of our, uh, of our four-star bosses here in this theater. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. We move on to our next question from Steve Trimble. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Got you loud and clear, Steve, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to ask, um, you know, uh, back in the 1980s, uh, USAFE had uh, ground launch cruise missiles deployed uh, in Europe, and then the, of course the INF Treaty was signed, and now that's uh, no longer in effect. Um, do you think the um, uh, USAFE needs uh, Glickums on the ground in Europe um, now? Well, that's a that's a great question. I think it ties in, Steve, with uh, with the discussion that the Joint Force is having uh, with long range fires, and uh, I think General Hyten recently said it pretty well that you know his in his view, there's a long range fires option from every uh, domain and from every service, and so. Uh, getting out of uh, you know who who does what necessarily. I think you know certainly we would argue that there's an agility and a flexibility to air launch cruise missiles that uh, that you don't get in any other way. But but the the uh, the ability to flex between ground launched, air launched, uh, and uh, sea launched uh, cruise missiles gives us uh, it, it, you know opportunities there to keep the threat at risk uh, from from all corners and all quadrants. Um, certainly in a, in a pinch, the quickest way to get, um, you know, long range fires uh, into a theater, if they don't already exist is through the air. And so we'll always fight to have that capability and to, to be, a uh, you know, really a seminal part of that long range fires discussion. But I think there absolutely is value, uh, kind of across the board in ensuring that there's options, uh, from each of the services without, uh, without anyone, um, trying to or feeling the need to take ownership of uh, the capacity and capability writ large. I think there's a place for, for each service to, to, to show its wares. And, and as uh, General Brown would say, uh, use the best athlete, whoever's best postured and most capable in that arena um, at the time is who we go with. And that's, uh, and I think the Air Force has a lot of, uh, you know, certainly uh, uh, has a lot of game in that regard and will continue to have and we continue to, to evolve and um, revolutionize some of those capabilities that are coming down the pipeline uh, and look forward to, to bringing some of those systems and capabilities to bear in, in this theater and in others. Well, and I, I apologize because I, I meant to, uh, uh, you know, specify in my question that uh, those were, of course, were nuclear ground launch cruise missiles in the 1980s. And uh, in, in your response, are you you talking more about conventional or, or nuclear? Yeah, I'm definitely talking conventional, Steve. Okay, all right. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, we, you know, um, the, the nuclear question is an interesting one uh, from a Glickham uh, nuke perspective. Uh, I will tell you, it, it isn't one I have a, I've had a ton of conversations about uh, recently, but uh, it's certainly something for us to think about. Got it. Thank you. Uh, we also have a question uh, that's been sent in from uh, retired Major General David Clemente. Uh, given DOD's drumbeat of a shift to pure competition, how is AFRICOM and by extension USAFE uh, Air Forces Africa adapting strategy to A, 
message support to partners and allies in the Africa AOR, and B, adapting strategy to create dilemmas in the region for peers, mostly China. Uh, thanks, sir, for the question. Thank you for your service, and, uh, and appreciate you, you tuning in today and, and, and listen, listening to uh, the conversation. I appreciate you bringing up the AFRICOM question. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I will get to your question specifically right after I make this one point. And I think one of the ways that we uh, describe the African AOR uh, is evolving in that, um, you know, much like in Europe, we talk about Europe broadly, but then we very quickly narrow in on a country uh, and a partner specifically and how we're going to engage with them. Typically in Africa, we don't do it that way. We talk about African problems. We talk about regional problems, which they certainly do too, but we have to acknowledge that each of the countries is different. Each of their needs is different. Some of them are very capable. Uh, some of them have need some help. Uh, and until we are more comfortable addressing the African continent bilaterally, uh, uh, it, it, we're, we're going to probably continue to underperform, uh, continue to underperform, that's, that's the wrong word, uh, phrase to use, but we're probably not going to optimize the relationships uh, to, the, the, to the degree that we could. Um, now to, to your, your question about uh, competition in Africa, um, and, and the reason I, I started with that first point is that competition is, is local in Africa. Uh, and we have to, we, we need to understand that uh, the relationships matter a lot uh, in, in all of the nations and the African continent. Uh, and we also need to know that both Russia and China are aggressively uh, working to gain uh, um, footholds and to gain uh, relationship, relationships and to gain um, uh, leverage uh, across the continent uh, in ways that uh, should be troubling really to us, and whether that's in providing funding to uh, countries that really need the money uh, for ports and access, uh, to uh, just uh, predatory lending practices, to influence behavior uh, that is not helpful, might be helpful for a particular regime, but not helpful for the population. Uh, both of those nations are uh, aggressively getting into Africa to suit their own needs, uh, really with the needs of the African uh, population uh, and the nations. Uh, secondary. Uh, and that's where we have an advantage over, over them, frankly, even though our footprint isn't there in a big way. Uh, our partners there understand that we also have their, you know, while we want the best for them, uh, and we want to uh, work with them diligently to gain them capability, we want the best for their population as well. Uh, and, you know, General Townsend will tell you, uh, global power competition is alive and well in the African continent and in the Africa, in the AFRICOM AOR. And he's uh, really uh, put a lot of uh, emphasis on us also competing uh, with Russia and China in Africa and competing on a global scale to not just frustrate them, but to help build up our partners. And, and we find that you know, where, we where we focus on building up partners, the frustration for them just occurs naturally. We don't need to uh, bang that drum that, uh, about the behavior that they're, uh, that they're exhibiting. Uh, what we do need to show is a different option for our partners in that uh, in that AOR uh, and give them another way to make um, uh, things happen that are to, to the benefit of their of their nation and, and to the of their population and to strengthen uh, our partnerships across the board and to strengthen their resilience in the face of predatory practices and aggressive uh, behaviors out of uh, out of the peers that we know are down there kind of stirring up trouble. Um, so, uh, you know, General, uh, I'll tell you, General Reagan is very focused on the AFRICOM uh, AOR and his AFAF hat, uh, and General Townsend certainly uh, is putting pressure uh, on the entire joint force down in the African continent uh, to compete with uh, Russia and China uh, because that competition is global, and, and Africa and AFRICOM certainly has a role to play there in, um, in, uh, in helping us compete uh, against uh, those two peers in particular. Thank you. Uh, you know, not only was I not able to get through all of my questions, but just simply because there's so much to talk with you about, we weren't able to get through all of our audience's questions, and I apologize for that. But we've come to the, to the end of the, this hour. As an alert to our listeners, our next event is tomorrow, Wednesday, September 9th, when the Mitchell Institute will host uh, Mr. Moshe Patel. Mr. Patel is the Director and General Manager of the Israeli Missile Defense Organization. 
As I mentioned, we've come to the end of the Aerospace Nation. And sir, I'd like to thank you for your insightful comments and sharing your perspective on uh, these critical issues. Uh, and to our audience, thank you for joining us today. From all of us here at the Mitchell Institute, have a great Aerospace Day.